Good morning, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Today, we're going to talk about epigenetics and food environment. This may be something you've never heard of before, but it's a really good topic and it's a passion of mine to kind of learn more about how our genetics actually do play a role in the environment we put ourselves in when it comes to nutrition and just how we are as people. So today we're going to go quickly a little bit kind of into science a little bit, just so some of the things when I'm talking about, they kind of make sense. So we got a quick crash course on biology, and then we'll get into epigenetics, and then environment and nutritional epigenetics. And then we're briefly going to talk about the food industry and the environment, and then what we can do. So first off, that crash course on biology. So... If you are new to whole, this whole thing, of course, we're gonna need to quickly go over biochemistry and genetics just a little bit before I can talk to you about what epigenetics is. So cells, these are the fundamental working units of every human being. All of the instructions required to direct your activities are contained in the chemical deoxyribonucleic acid, also known as DNA. DNA from humans is made up of approximately 3 billion nucleotide bases. There are four fundamental types of these bases that make up DNA, and that's adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, commonly abbreviated as A, C, G, and T. The sequence or the order that those bases go in is what determines your life's instructions. So interestingly enough, our DNA sequence is mostly similar to that of a chimpanzee. I'm sure you've heard that before too as well. And only a fraction of distinctively different sequences makes us human and makes them chimps. So that's always really fascinating too. Within the 3 billion bases, there are about 20,000 genes. Now genes are specific sequences of bases that provide instructions on how to make important proteins. So that's kind of one thing I want to point out too is that Proteins aren't just the things that build our muscles and make us strong. Proteins do a lot in our body. And proteins are those complex molecules that trigger various biological actions to carry out life functions. So in other words, DNA gives the instructions for various proteins to be produced inside a cell. And this is kind of known as the central dogma of molecular biology. And so that's kind of a little bit into genetics. So now we can get into epigenetics. So epigenetics refers to the control of gene expression via mechanisms that aren't directly related to the DNA coding sequence. So as a result, all the cells in an organism have very different phenotypes despite having the same genome. Now, epigenetics modulates and regulates gene expression through various marks. And this is a term that's given to chemical compounds that are added to DNA or histone proteins. And these are recognized by enzymes that either lay down or remove that specific mark. These marks change their kind of conformation of chromatin and that either it compacts it, so it prevents it binding to other things or it opens it and it allows that transcription factor, and that kind of helps upregulate cellular processes. So essentially epigenetics is the study of how your behaviors and your environment can cause changes that affect the way your genes work. And I'm not talking about your genes, the pants that you wear, your G-E-N-E-S genes. Unlike genetic changes, epigenetic changes are reversible. They do not change your DNA sequence, but they change how your body reads a DNA sequence. Epigenetics controls our genes and that's achieved, achieved through nature. Epigenetics is what determines a cell's specialization, so skin cell, blood cell, hair cell, liver, liver cells, etc. As a fetus develops into a baby through gene expression and then also there's nature but there's also nurture. Environmental stimuli can also cause genes to be turned off or on. Epigenetics is everywhere. What you eat, where you live, who you interact with, when you sleep, how you exercise, and even aging. All of these can eventually cause chemical modifications around the genes that can turn those genes on or off over time. 
Additionally, in certain diseases like cancer or Alzheimer's, there are various genes that will be switched into the opposite state away from a normal or healthy state. Epigenetics also makes us unique. Even though we're all human, why do some of us have blonde hair and darker skin? Why do some of us hate the taste of mushrooms or eggplants? Why are some of us more sociable than the others? So the different combination of genes that are turned on or off is what makes all of us also unique. And furthermore, there have been indications that some epigenetic changes can even be inherited. And then lastly, epigenetics is reversible. And that's the big takeaway with this entire presentation. Remember that it is reversible. With more than 20,000 genes, what will be the result of the different combinations of genes being turned on or off? The possible arrangements are enormous, <laughs> but if we could map out every single cause and effect of the different combinations, and if we could reverse the gene state to keep the good while eliminating the bad, then we could, of course, hypothetically cure cancer. We could slow aging, we could stop obesity, and so much more. So let's go into environmental epigenetics. This refers to how the environment exposures that we are in every day affect our epigenetic changes. So life experiences, habits, and our environment shape what and who we are by virtue of their impact on our epigenome and our health. So for instance, although identical twins, they share the same genome and are superficially, you know, phenotypically similar, they are unique individuals with definable differences. These differences result from distinct gene expression influenced by epigenetic factors. Behavior, nutrition, exposure to toxins and pollutants are among the lifestyle factors known to be associated with epigenetic modifications. So for example, nutrition is a key environmental exposure from gestation to death that impacts our health by influencing this phenomenon. In another example, um, recent Data suggests that the increased incidence of cancer observed in the developed world since the 1960s could partly be due to exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals to which human and wildlife were exposed to daily from multiple sources. So there's a lot that can play a role in this. Traditional advice to have a better diet is repeated so often that most of us can recite it in our sleep. Eat less, move more, eat more fruits and veggies, cut back on sugar. I'm sure you've heard us say that during these seminars too. And yeah, it's solid advice that can result in better health, but there may be one factor that undercuts all of your best efforts to eat well, and that is your environment. We can have the best intentions for dietary changes only to have our environment rise up and stop us right in our tracks. Environment is just a great outdoors. It's every setting we are in daily from our work to our home to our car. Environment can also mean any family, friends, or health challenges that affect health and wellness goals. So we'll break into that a little bit more. So the office, this is a big one. Um, I know a lot of us are in the office right now, but many offices have break rooms and donuts magically appear in those break rooms a lot or leftover pastries from meetings or events from people's family over the weekend always end up in those break rooms. Other challenging aspects of the office environment include birthdays and retirement and other parties where cake and chips are present and delicious, right? Many people try to avoid them. They try to bring in their own lunch and this can work more often than not, but peer office pressure can kind of result in one too many cookies at a mid-morning break or abandoning your lunch completely in the fridge so you can go grab lunch at a local restaurant. And then your home, believe it or not, where you store your food can be a key factor when it comes to how your environment can affect your diet. It can be a big challenge to maintain a healthy environment that encourages your health and wellness goals. So keeping snack-like food in easy reach means we're gonna eat more of it. And the same goes for you know, all of the sugar-filled cereals and chips and different things like that that we keep at home too. And then family, friends. So there's no harder environment to counteract this when it comes to unhealthy eating habits that are created by family and friends, whether it's picky kids that insist on nightly chicken nuggets that you might finish up after dinner, family celebrations filled with comfort, food served in huge bowls, family style, buffet, 
or outings with friends that include bar food and cocktails and many other gatherings that pose as a huge challenge for those that are eating healthy. And then the grocery store. Grocery stores are built to get consumers to buy more expensive prepackaged foods. The layout of the store itself moves you towards the bakery and the center aisles where more expensive and unhealthy foods exist. The most sugary cereals are at both adult and child eye level. Some stores even scent their entrances with the aroma of baked goods to trigger your brain's desire to eat. When you're hungry, you're also gonna buy more food. And then illness, this one's a little tough. So it's not strictly an environment, but a chronic illness such as chronic pain can be very challenging when it comes to eating healthy. When you are in pain, the last thing you wanna do is worry about healthy cooking and eating. Why chop up vegetables and bake chicken when you can eat a box of macaroni and cheese because that's a lot easier. As anyone with a chronic condition can attest, one of the hardest parts of the day is probably mealtime. Especially for chronic pain patients with children or families to feed, the struggle to find the time and the energy to put those meals on the table can make every day feel like an uphill battle. Eating a healthier diet with pain or other chronic illness is possible and it can actually reduce your pain levels moving forward. But again, that can be very challenging for some. And then in your mind, our brains are so powerful. They're both for and against healthy eating. While you may eat a beautiful, colorful salad for lunch, your brain may convince you that one healthy meal deserves a treat. Your brain is hardwired to crave sugary foods. And with enough of them, the structure is actually changed in the same manner as a person who's addicted to cocaine, not only is the environment of the mind fertile ground for positively rethinking about the way we approach food, it can also trick us into believing that we are eating better than we actually are. So now let's move on to nutritional epigenetics. Many of us are familiar with the foods that damage our bodies, the ones that slow your metabolism, they might add a few pounds, they might stiffen our arteries, but what if certain food items could help or harm us in a place we may never have even considered like our DNA? Nutrients in different foods and supplements we consume may be able to adjust or reverse epigenetic mechanisms. Epigenetics is highly involved in adjusting the tags that affect our health and our susceptibility, I can never say that word, <laughs> our chances of getting a disease, let's say it that way. I put it in there and knew I wasn't gonna be able to say it, but that's okay. Anyway, nutrition is one of the most studied and better understood environmental epigenetic factors. Associations have been observed between adverse prenatal nutrition conditions, postnatal health, and increased risk of disease. Nutrition in our early life is also a key factor in our genes, not just what we eat, but what our mothers ate. And we'll learn more about all of this in the next few slides too as well. So again, nutrition in early life induces long-term changes in your DNA methylation, and that impacts on in individual health and age-related diseases all throughout your life. Nutrients and bioactive food components can reversibly alter your DNA methylation status, your histone modifications, and your chromatin remodeling, which again, as we talked about earlier, that all affects our epigenetics and what gets turned on and what gets turned off. So prenatal exposure. The first months of pregnancy seem to have the greatest effect on disease risk. For example, children who were conceived during the Dutch famine cohort study, and this was in 1990, 1944 to 1945, it tended to have smaller than usual offspring, suggesting that the effects may persist and impact our children and even beyond. And it seems likely that the fetus epigenetically adapts in response to a limited supply of nutrients, the evidence for transgenerational effects of poor maternal diet on human populations with respect to metabolic outcomes was also examined. And there's evidence from historical records that the grandchildren of women who were exposed to famine and other dietary alterations during pregnancy were more likely to experience health complications than their control counterparts of so people who worked in that famine. And this included increased risk of type 2 diabetes cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders, and decreased cognitive function. 
Nutrition in early life also induces long-term changes in DNA methylation and that impact on individual health and age-related diseases all throughout our life. So who do you think most determines the birth weight of a test tube baby? The donor mom who provided all the DNA or the surrogate mom who provided that intrauterine environment? So they put this to the test because they were like, okay, if someone's going through, they saw all of these studies of women through a famine and what was happening to their children and their grandchildren. So what happens if a healthy mom can't carry a baby and a surrogate comes in and carries the baby for them? Who determines the birth weight of that test tube baby? Well, when it was put to the test, the womb won. Incredibly, a baby born to an OB surrogate mother with a skinny biological mom can harbor a greater risk of becoming obese than a baby from an overweight biological mom born to a slimmer surrogate. The researchers concluded that the environment provided by the human mother is more important than her genetic contribution to the birth weight of that baby. So the most compelling data comes from comparing obesity rates and siblings born to the exact same mother before and after a bariatric surgery. So compared to their brothers and sisters who were born before the surgery, those born when mom weighed about 100 pounds less had lower rates of inflammation, metabolic derangements, and more critically, three times less risk of developing severe obesity. The researchers concluded that the data that they found it just emphasizes how critical it is to prevent obesity and treat it effectively to prevent further transmission to future generations. So even though the mom had the same DNA before and after surgery, she passed the same genes down. So how could her weight during pregnancy affect the weight destiny of her children any differently? Well, Darwin himself admitted that the greatest error he committed has been not allowing sufficient weight to the direct action of the environment like food independently of natural selection. So they finally figured out the mechanism by which this happens and that's epigenetics. So all of this science going on in the background with nutrition and what we eat, how much it can actually affect our offspring when we do get pregnant is absolutely crucial. Nutrients and bioactive food components can therefore alter your DNA methylation, which we've talked about. And again, this alters the gene expression of having an impact on your overall health. The bioactive food components, specific nutrients, and your dietary patterns can have beneficial effects and overcome the negative impact of negative life behaviors like smoking or exposure to certain chemicals. So that's in comparison to the food we're eating, that we can compare the effect of what we're eating to the effect of our life behaviors like smoking or being exposed to chemicals. That has the same impact as what we eat. So we'll kind of get into that a little bit here with food industry and the environment. The food industry is a critical factor in any potentially successful long-term strategy to prevent obesity. By producing new products low in energy density and improving the nutritional quality, of existing products, as well as through advances in responsible marketing and labeling, the food industry can provide foods that enable consumers to achieve lower energy intakes without going short of essential nutrients. And it wasn't always this way. The number of calories in the food supply actually declined over the first half of the 20th century, only starting its upward climb in the 1970s. The drop in the first half of the century was attributed to the reduction in hard manual labor the population had decreased energy needs, so they ate decreased energy diets. They didn't need all of the extra calories because they weren't working as hard. But then the so-called energy balance flipping point occurred when the move less, stay lean phase that existed throughout most of the century turned into the eat more and gain weight phase that still plagues us to the day. So I also had to put on here, if you haven't seen this show, The Food That Built America, it's actually very fascinating to watch. So I kind of wanted to plug that a little bit because that was a very cool show that my husband and I stumbled upon. But anyway, so what happened in the 1970s was a revolution in the food industry. In the 1960s, most of the food was prepared and cooked in the home. The average, quote unquote, not working wife spent hours a day cooking and cleaning up after meals. 
But then a mixed blessing transformation took place. Technological advances in food preservation and packaging enabled manufacturers to mass prepare and distribute food for ready consumption. So this has been compared to what happened a century before in the industrial revolution with the mass production and supply of manufactured goods. This time they were just mass producing food and using new perspectives and new preservatives and artificial flavors and techniques such as deep freezing and vacuum packaging, food corporations could take advantage of economies of scale to mass produce ready-made durable edible food that offered an enormous commercial advantage over fresh and perishable foods. Fast food continued to take off in the 80s and 90s too as well, even with the prevalence of obesity taking over and fears of eating fat were around, following celebrity chefs, but also sticking to diets. All of this was occurring as the workforce was changing and more women were working and not staying at home. So that simplicity of going through a drive through for dinner made life a lot easier for some of those hardworking families. What we choose to eat plays a large role in determining our risk of gaining too much weight. But our choices are shaped by the complex world in which we live in, um, the food that we're close to, the kinds of foods that our parents made available at home, um, how close we are to a supermarket, and even by the ways that the government supports farmers. In the U.S. and many parts of the world, the so-called food environment, the physical and social surroundings that influence what we eat, makes it far too hard to choose healthy foods and all too easy to choose unhealthy foods. Some even call this food environment toxic because of the way it corrodes healthy lifestyles and promotes obesity. Researchers have looked at how the settings in which we live from homes and neighborhoods to our work sites and schools influence which foods are available, how much they cost, whether the people in those settings are eating healthy diets. And they've also examined broader societal influences on individual food choices from food marketing to government policies. And there's a lot that goes into both the settings and the you know, society and how that shapes what we eat. So one of the big ones is family. The food that families keep at home and how family members share meals influences what and how much they eat. Not surprisingly, a recent review of published studies found a strong association between the availability of fruits and vegetables at home and whether children and adolescents and adults actually ate that food. Eating meals as a family has also been linked with increased child and adolescent intake of fruit and vegetables, as opposed to not eating together as a family. And then your neighborhood. People are going to have a hard time eating healthfully if healthy foods just aren't available where they live. Several aspects of the neighborhood food environment have drawn research attention to them and how the presence or lack of nearby supermarkets and convenience stores and fast food restaurant, restaurants relates to obesity risk. And then food marketing. In 2008, the Federal Trade Commission reported that the food industry spends $10 billion a year marketing food and beverages in the United States that appeal to children and adolescents. And that was in 2008. $10 billion in commercials and marketing on how food can appeal to little kids. And that includes $1.6 billion to target children and adolescents directly with soft drinks, fast food, and just cereal alone. And then the government plays a role too as well. In the past 30 years, the price of fruit and vegetables rose much faster than the prices of all other consumer goods in the United States. At the time, the price of sugar, sweets, and carbonated drinks declined relative to other products. So the government can set policies that influence the price and availability of foods that in turn influence the risk of obesity. So what can we do? As the obesity epidemic has grown, researchers and public health advocates have been calling for public policy efforts to address this toxic food environment. But what about what we talked about earlier? How do we address the epigenetics issue? There's no single environmental change that would halt the rise in obesity or related health problems. Instead, improving the food environment will require a lot of work across a wide range of sectors and settings from government and industry to local and institutions and families. And of course, it's up to us as individuals to make changes that are better for our future 
and for the future of our families and our communities. So to get started, we can address some healthier habits that you can implement at home because it always does start with you first. So organizing your fridge is a first step towards creating a healthier fridge and pantry. Making a few simple changes can help you become a more efficient cook and also reduce waste. So in your fridge itself, the door of the fridge, many of us, I'm guilty, I found out this too, um, we use the doors to store milk and eggs, but that's not the best place for it um, because these are very temperature sensitive foods and doors are the warmest part of the fridge and milk and eggs should be kept colder to extend usable life. So store things like condiments and juices in the doors of your fridge only. And then the upper shelves, that's a great place for grab and go foods and snacks like tortillas, hummus, and leftovers. And then the lower shelf, this is the coldest place in the fridge. This is where you wanna store those temperature sensitive items like your eggs, your yogurt, your meat, and make sure that you're taking care of raw meat or seafood and keeping that away from other foods just in case something's gonna leak out of the packaging. And then the crisper drawers. These are designed to maintain a cool and humid atmosphere to keep our fruits and veggies fresher, lasting longer. So fruit should be stored separately from vegetables as certain fruits and vegetables give off ethylene and that's a natural gas that just speeds up the ripening process. Delicate fruits like berries should be stored on upper shelves and washed right before eating. Vegetables like greens and lettuce, carrots and celery can be washed and chopped for easy prep. And then of course the freezer. The key to eliminating food waste and making your job as a cook easier is labeling and rotating anything that you freeze. So if you make extra soups or sauces or freezer meals, making sure that they're laid flat so you can optimize space, but also making sure that you label everything and what date you place it in the freezer. And you're not always taking things from the front and you're taking things from the back or the bottom too as well. And Organizing your fridge is just the beginning. The key to a healthier fridge and pantry is gonna be in what you buy. Many of us reach for convenience food with tons of fat and salt and sugar and preservative because they're just that, they're convenient. So the trick is to make eating healthier seem a lot easier. So when you're stocking your fridge and your freezer, these are really good healthy staples to always have in your fridge or freezer or pantry. Um, cheese and you can cut that up into cubes and slices as soon as you bring it home and you can kind of put that on the shelf so that's easy to grab for a quick snack. Baby carrots, celery that's cut up or sugar snap peas, berries, apples, oranges or pears, um, unsweetened yogurt, eggs, you can hard boil those and have those readily available for a snack. Nuts you can store in the freezer so they last longer. Whole grains like rice, quinoa or barley. Fermented foods, pickles, kimchi, leftover roast turkey or chicken, tortillas, cooked pasta, chicken or vegetable stock, fish, chicken, grass-fed beef, and then frozen vegetables are really good to have if you need to add something to kind of round out a meal or if you need to add something to soups. And then again, continuing for the pantry, dried pasta, so I mentioned just briefly before this cooked pasta, if you're someone that kind of likes to um, meal prep a little bit, if you have pasta that's already cooked, you can throw in some protein and some sauce readily right there. So that way you can make meals very quickly. But in your pantry, you can have a different variety of dried pasta, beans, rice, different grains, tomatoes, vegetables, oils for cooking, canned tuna, granola, jarred pasta sauce. Um, and then if you're going ethnic with what you're cooking, making sure you have salsa, enchilada sauce, taco sauce. Um, with Asian, make sure you have fish sauce or sesame oil or soy sauce and all the different spices to help make our food taste better. And then chocolate. Can't go wrong with having chocolate in your pantry, especially dark chocolate. So I kind of dabbled on meal prep a little bit. So when you already have a stocked and healthier fridge and pantry, Make sure that you're using all the food that you already bought. And even before you go to the grocery store to even like begin meal prep, make sure you stop and think about what dinners you're gonna prepare for the week ahead. Or if you like to cook for an entire week on a Sunday, that way you've got your food and everything ready to go. 
Um, just meal planning is going to help eliminate waste at home, and it also keeps you from making impulse purchases at the grocery store. If you sit and plan everything you're going to make for that week, write it down and go to the grocery store with that list. And then I mentioned earlier cutting up cheese or those vegetables. Plan ahead for those healthy snacks by washing and chopping and pre-portioning all of your vegetables and other food that you have, washing your produce as soon as you get it at home. Because I don't know about you, but if I buy strawberries and I don't cut them, they don't get eaten in our house. But if I get them home, wash them and cut them up and put them in a bowl and make sure that they're visible, they'll be gone in a day or two. And as you cook for the week, make sure to store leftovers at eye level. And if you have clear containers, that helps too as well. Um, but if they just get shoved to the back of your fridge, you're not even going to know what that leftover is if it just keeps getting shoved to the back and we keep forgetting about it. And just making sure that you're getting intentional is what we're going to end this presentation on. Beyond all of these tips, there are a few more things that you can do that easily reframe how you eat, how much you eat, and when. If it works for you and your family, consider to have things on your counters. Keep snack foods off of your counters and make it inconvenient to reach into your cupboards. And if you must keep food on your counters, make it easy to eat fruits like clementines and apples and bananas. Remember that service matters. So mimicking the environment of a restaurant, serving food individually portioned on the plates instead of family or like buffet style. Remember that size matters. So trying to use a smaller plate to decrease portion sizes. Remember to pay attention. Turn off your TV, sit at a dinner table and eat mindfully. Pay attention to what you're eating. Chew your food slowly. Talk about your day with your family. Slowing down is going to help give your brain time to receive the signal that you're full, and that can result in less overeating too as well. And that is all I have for you today. And we're going to kind of branch off into this next week when I talk about obesity and junk food. I'll talk a little bit about the environment again um, and the food industry and marketing and how that has a really big effect on us too as well. But we're gonna start off next week talking about the obesity epidemic that we're experiencing in America and basically all over the world. And I also am going to talk about different triggers about why we eat, why we reach for snacks, why we do different things like that. So next week is gonna be a really good one to join to as well. So make sure you hop on next week for our obesity and junk food talk.